I hope you've been enjoying all of our Tom Talks episodes to date. We've had a lot of fun making them. Over the last couple of months, we've had several requests for a Q&A, which today we're going to satisfy. We have asked you to provide us with questions. We invited you on all of our social media platforms. I've received private messages, uh, messages from friends and clients, questions that I have no idea why they want to know the answer of, but anyway, we're going to try and answer as many as possible without avoiding any. So let's see how we get on and I hope you enjoy it. Our stock value really fluctuates. Uh, if you walked into the showroom today, I would imagine we probably got, uh, looking out in the showroom now, maybe probably north of 50 million pounds in stock. Uh, however, you know, recently, a few months ago, we sold a Ferrari 250 GTO, and if you have just one 250 GTO um, additional, then obviously that can make a big change in your stock, but on many occasions we'll carry over a hundred million pounds worth of cars in the showroom. We don't really have that many competitors. Um, no other dealer offers the diverse selection of stock that we do from Formula One cars to vintage cars to classic cars to modern supercars um, and also uh, a big aspect of our business is that we buy you know 90 to 95 percent of our in of our inventory so which clients really appreciate because it shows that we have faith and belief in the cars that we're selling and also it offers um, a seller a very easy hassle-free process of liquidating his car is a very valuable asset by just calling us up and you know within a couple of days the car we may have bought the car paid him for it and collected it best and worst deal hmm that's an interesting one um, I'm not sure if I can answer best deal. I could probably tell you what the most fun deal was of recent times. Uh, I recall going to Japan, going to Tokyo to buy the delivery mileage yellow McLaren F1. That was only maybe a week after my wife had our third child and she wasn't very happy me uh, leaving her bedside to run to Japan for a couple of days, but you know, it was a good experience um, and it was it turned out to be a very good deal for the business. Worst deal, uh, you know, there's, we've lost money in cars, we do lose money in cars. I don't ever cry over spilt milk. It was the right decision on the day when we bought it and the difference between my business compared to brokers that we compete against is that we have skin in the game. You know, and sometimes the downside to that is that we have to take losses. And, you know, when you're selling cars for sometimes tens of millions of pounds, those losses don't work out to five and 10 and 15,000. But, you know, I'm a big boy and I don't cry over spilt milk. And there's not one particular deal that is sore or springs to mind. Best selling sports car from the 90s, you would probably use Porsche 993. Ooh, well, first of all, um, not an easy question to answer because um, we are not financial advisors. Whenever somebody comes to me, which happens often, clients come and say, sell my business, I want to invest 10, 20, 50 million in cars, what shall I buy, Tom? Um, we, I take great satisfaction in helping a client assemble uh, a fantastic collection. I never ever say, this is a great investment, because um, 
ultimately if I'm right and the car goes up in value I'm yet to receive another check in the post and where a client turns around and goes yep yeah, Tom you were right the car's gone up here's some extra money as a thank you and if it goes down then I'm sure I would get um, plenty of abuse verbal abuse that is so I don't like to ever um, advise somebody to buy a car as an investment or a good investment um, but if I was investing five million pounds over the next five to ten years I would probably say a Ferrari F40 as it appeals to such a huge audience to the um, new generation that's coming through it's still a poster car to the old school car collector it's a very important Ferrari um, so I would include an F40 I think Grand Prix cars, Grand Prix winning Formula One cars are undervalued uh, and I think they'll continue to grow. You probably wouldn't have much change actually if you bought a Grand Prix winning um, uh, a Grand Prix winning Formula One car and a Ferrari F40, that's probably five million car. Ooh, that's an interesting one. Um, as a sports personality, I would probably choose James Hunt, and we would probably go to somewhere like uh, Vegas. Although I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't let Charlene know because uh, I'm sure he'd get us into a bit of trouble. Um, as a business, you know, uh, as a business personality, somebody like Howard Hughes. Um, I suffer a little bit with OCD, a little bit like uh, I believe. He did, and he was a very—he uh, was a pioneer, um, and obviously a very successful uh, businessman. So, and he's not somebody I ever had the chance to meet. So maybe somebody like Howard Hughes. Do I want my kids to go into the business? Um, I suppose. I wouldn't be truthful if I said that I wouldn't have a um, desire for the kids to come into the business at some stage. However, it's more important to me that they do something that they enjoy, that they want to do, because ultimately, if you if you don't enjoy what you do, uh, you'll never be any good at it. You know, I am okay at what I do because it's my passion. I love it. I always say that my business is my hobby and my hobby is my business, so I'm blessed and I hope all of our kids uh, feel the same way one day, whatever they do. There's several cars still on the list that I would like to tick off before I hang my gloves up. You know, what springs to mind? Maybe the 300 SLR Sterling Moss winning Mille Miglia um, car that's been owned by Mercedes Benz from new. If uh, the factory ever need the money one day and you want to sell some cars, I'd love to buy that, although I'm pretty certain that's not going to happen. Um, but we won't give up. You know, there's some fantastic Ferraris out there that Ferrari's my passion and there's some fantastic Ferraris that I long to own. Um, some great, you know, TR59, a, uh, there's a couple of fantastic GTOs, there's obviously the P4, um, yeah, there's, there's lots of cars that we have still got to uh, tick off. Other side of the lake, um, I will assume you're referring to the lake that my father and brother has, and no, that is a different lake. We always take our pictures in exactly the same place in front of our lake. I think a Chiron is a very impressive car 
the build quality is fantastic. However, the Veyron was the original and I believe in years to come, the Veyron, I'm talking you know, maybe 20 years in the future, um, the Veyron, they, they only built 252 normal Veyrons and I believe that they will be the most sought after Kells to own. And they're still way undervalued. A Veyron, in my opinion, should be you know, a lot more money, but that's for another time. The car I regret selling the most, um, I don't have many regrets because it was the right decision on the day. Um, I would have loved to have been able to have kept the McLaren F1 chassis 59 as that was a car that I had known from virtually new. It belonged to my best client at that time and I used to sit in the car and imagine owning it uh, like every month for 12 years, maybe 15 years, and then one day I bought it um, and unfortunately, well not unfortunately, but I took a profit and uh, moved on. Favourite holiday destination? I would, I think my wife would probably say the Bahamas and I'm not that fussed. I miss work whenever I'm not in the office, when I'm away for longer than a few days, um, I'm happy to get home. So, you know, I, I probably like skiing the most. Turnover is very important. Ideally, we would like to sell a car the day we buy it and uh, reinvest our money in more stock. However, because of the nature of the cars that we sell, particularly the old cars, we can buy a car put it into restoration, we add value, we can hold the car for a couple of years in restoration, and then look at selling the car once the restoration is complete. Um, trading cars, some of the modern cars, we're always happy to trade cars, i.e. the colour of everybody's money is the same to me. It's a lot more difficult trading the higher end cars because respectfully there isn't many dealers in the world that buy cars that are say north of a million pounds, let alone north of five million pounds. Um, so we are not, you know, we're not likely to be trading many of those. That's an easy one. Favourite watch brand is of course Patek Philippe. Uh, any model in particular, I, I actually really like the 5990. I put the hours in. I normally wake about 7am. I am in the office for somewhere between 8 to 8.30. I normally leave the office at 7.30 of an evening. I go home, I have dinner, and then I go in my office at home until about 11 p.m. So my wife gets to see me a lot. That's incorrect. I actually passed my driving test in a Ferrari 360 Modena. Uh, at the time, that was for insurance reasons. Uh, the insurance company, um, I don't know how it came about, but thought it would be um, better for my insurance premium if uh, I passed my test in a car that I'm most likely to be driving, and that's how that happened. There's only one football team, I'm a red, and we're not talking about red from Liverpool, Man United. Ooh, dream three car garage, uh, Ferrari 250 Testarossa, McLaren F1, Jaguar XKSS.
Ambition, uh, very motivated uh, to continue to grow the business, to have a bigger market share, want to be the only place to contact if you're looking to buy or sell a very important car and to grow the brand. Polter's car collection, well, um, because of my input, it's very good of course, no, I'm only kidding. Um, Polter's car collection, he's, he's got great taste, you know, he many years ago decided that he wanted to start collecting Ferraris, his timing in the market was very good, and he's assembled some great cars, you know, 275 GTB4, all the Ferrari supercars, La Ferrari Coupe, convertible. Um, he's got some really good cars and more impressive than his car collection is the museum that they sit in. Again, I don't have that many regrets. Uh, at the time it felt normal. I wouldn't want the same for my kids because I think the world has maybe moved on in the last 25, six years. Um, I don't regret leaving school at that age, but I wouldn't want the same for my kids. Favourite modern supercar would have to be either a Pagani Zonda or a Porsche Carrera GT for different reasons. You know, I love the Pagani Zonda aesthetically. I think it's a beautiful car. If you gave a child um, a pen and paper and asked them to draw a supercar, they probably wouldn't draw a Zonda, but they would radical shapes. And, you know, I think a Zonda is, it, it looks like a supercar and that's how supercars should look. Um, and a Crow GT, that engine, that V10, uh, and it's a phenomenal car to drive. So I'd say those two cars particularly stick out. If you were going to go back older, again, Ferrari 288 GTO, which was the first supercar. Um, you know, I love a Ferrari 288 GTO. Of course it's stressful. You know, what business, uh, what successful business or unsuccessful business isn't stressful. However, if it didn't make me happy, then I I wouldn't get up of a morning and drive to work. If I wasn't a car salesman, I would envisage I'd still be selling something else, if it was boats or planes. I'm a salesman at home. Koningsegg isn't a brand I'm particularly fond of. Um, I have had a couple in the past. The last model I had was a CCX, which I struggled to sell. The car was publicly advertised, and I then decided to put the car in auction. I put the car in auction and then Christian Koenigsegg uh, called me up and voiced his disappointment and at the time um, I think quoted something like I hope I am happy because I've destroyed his business with such a low estimate that I put on the car. However, it was a little bit of a stupid comment because if it was such a low estimate then it should have sold for more money and he ultimately should have bought it back. You know, we don't oversell cars here, we sell cars for what they're worth. I think he's done a good job of building a brand from nothing. And I believe the cars are a lot better now than when they originally started. However, it's not a brand that I'm particularly fond of and I much prefer Pagani. Hamilton, Schumacher, Senna or Lauda? Mm, that's a difficult one. Uh, you know, Schumacher 
Ferrari needed Schumacher when he came along and they needed Ross Braun and Jean Todd. I believe that trio, um, you know, they blended so well together, which made them so successful and dominating. Hamilton is just a superstar. Lauda is an incredible guy, an incredible businessman. Um, and I believe Senna, you know, he was just very, very talented. Uh, you know, for me, they're all special for different reasons. Well, you know, my father and I were partners from when I was 16 years old, and then later uh, my brother came into the business and was a full partner. Um, it was a very successful business, year on year it grew. And for me, since about 2007, you know, I, I was concentrating most of my time. Um, I had a real passion for classic cars and I was delegating a lot of time towards it. I saw a, you know, an opening in the market, which I thought was a great opportunity for us. Um, my father was never interested in old cars. Um, he doesn't really like cars. It's uh, for him. It's it's a business. It's a it's a ways and a means to um, to make money. Um, you know, we worked very well together for many years, and then it just felt like it was the right time for me to split away and set up my own enterprise that was really totally um, customized around me and uh, interested, uh, concentrated on the cars that I was particularly interested in. Pebble Beach is undoubtedly uh, my favorite car event. It is obviously on Pebble Beach and I'm a golfer. So, you know, what better setting? Uh, the committee do such a fantastic job. Um, there's no entry fee. They just ask you to donate some money to charity. You don't have to donate money to charity, but you know, the amount of work and effort that they put into organizing the event, um, I'd like to think that every participant does. That's my favorite car event. Uh, I like the Heaven and Paul Concours, which is a new event organized by um, John and Lois Hunt. They uh, based down in Suffolk, they do a fantastic job. The kids love it, love going to it. We missed it for the first time last year, but that's also a great event. I like the Concorde de Elegance that's organised. Um, it's at Hampton Court Palace, but organised through Buckingham Palace. And um, Prince Michael of Kent is the patron. That's a, that's also a great event. And Villa Deste, you know, Villa Deste is on Lake Como. It's just beautiful. I enjoy it, my wife enjoys it, my daughter enjoys it. The setting, the cars, the whole event is five star. Charlene, of course. You know, auctions, there's uh, Gooding, there's RM, Sotheby's, there's Bonhams, which would probably be the three leading auction houses. They all do a great job. You know, I do business with all of them. They're all good people. I'm very fortunate with the support that I receive from Charlene and the kids. Um, you know, I work very long hours and she doesn't complain. She doesn't complain when we have to cut holidays short. You know, my kids, my daughter in particular, she, over the last few years, specifically asks to join me when I have to go away for the, the weekend, if it's to go and look at a car in Monaco or to go to a car event, she tags along. She's my wing girl of recent years um, so you know I'm very fortunate because if I had a wife that complained more or wasn't as supporting or as understanding 
then that would obviously affect my performance in business. La Ferrari. Volkswagen Golf. P1. Pro GT. Enzo. Indian. Blonde Brunette. You know, I, I bought and sold a lot of F50s over the years. Um, the last F50 we had was earlier on this year. We, we actually sold the car without advertising it. Uh, you know, I bought a delivery mileage car, the lowest mileage one in existence a couple of years ago. We've sold probably half a dozen F50s in the last half a dozen years. It's not a car that I love as much as an F40 or a GTO. They've never been as loved as an F40 or a GTO. When they were new, they, they actually went down, they were under list um, for a long period of time. Um, they were actually an F50 and an F40, there wasn't much difference in them for many years. Um, you know, I think an F50 is overvalued at the moment. I think an F50 uh, will probably deservedly come back a little bit in the next. Uh, 12 to 18 months. Handicap at golf at the moment is my golf clubs. Um, my handicap used to be four, but I don't get to play as much these days. And, uh, you know, my, my handicap now is probably realistically a 10. The LFA is quite a quirky car. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if in 10, 15 years time, they became very sought after. They're not a car that, have, that has ever been that loved to date. Um, but you know, it wouldn't surprise me if that's a car for the future. Strangest vehicle handover. Hmm. Um, I don't think I've ever had that strange a vehicle handover anywhere. I mean, I recall last year we sold a McLaren F1 to a client in America and he wanted to hand over at uh, Monticello Racetrack just outside of New York, which I was very much up for um, and excited about. So I got straight on a plane car went straight to Monticello, I went straight to Monticello and we had uh, a great day and drove it around the track all day. No, I normally, uh, if it's going to be a car for my own private collection, it's a, from the outset it's for my own private collection. I have never bought a car for stock and then decided to keep it. And you, you, in this profession you can't afford to get too emotionally attached at the end of the day it's my business you know we buy and sell cars to make a profit and you know we deal with so many fantastic cars that when you get them in you read their history files or you you um, have an understanding for how special that particular car and chassis is that it would be so easy to fall in love with it and think oh I'm not going to sell that and I'll only sell that if I get a stupid price but that's not what the business is about. I'm a, a realist, we buy a car for X and we sell it for Y and move on to the next deal. Favourite song, if you know me, that's an easy one, Mac the Knife. Most famous person I've ever done business with, well, for obvious reasons, um, I can't or won't answer that. Uh, discretion, you know, is a very important um, attribute to my business, to me. 
Uh, we don't talk about clients that we deal with. We deal with some very high profile individuals, you know, some of the world's leading sports stars, people from the world of entertainment, um, more commonly very high profile uh, business people. But the reason why I am blessed with having such a great relationship with, a direct relationship with all of those individuals is they know that, uh, you know, they get trapped very much just like the, the guy who walks in from around the corner. Maybe it's because I've dealt with very high profile individuals for many years that it become, feels very normal to me. Um, and uh, you know, we color of everybody's money is the same to us. So whether it's the most famous guy in the world or the most successful athlete in the world, or if it's the guy who's just made his money out of selling potatoes, then I couldn't count this. And all of our clients know that. Favorite member of staff? Uh, I don't have a favorite member of staff. You know, I treat them all like my extended family. Turnover last year, last year was probably north of 150 million pounds. I don't recall the exact figure actually. You know, we have our accounts done quarterly and um, I don't study our accounts. I kind of know if we're doing well or not well. Um, and it's not something that, you know, is my ultimate drive. Oh, the Williams F1 experience was fantastic. Uh, firstly, Williams themselves, Williams Heritage Department, what a fantastic, um, what a fantastic job they've done of the two days we had there. Um, you know, all the crew that uh, that came down to Jerez. Um, it was a, a bucket list experience and something that I can't wait to do again. Everything was to the extreme, you know, the acceleration, the braking, the downforce, something that I'd never experienced before. And, you know, for many years I've driven the world's fastest cars. And, you know, the car I drove in Jerez was my 95 Williams um, FW17. So that car is 24 years old and it still blew my mind. So I can't even imagine what a car of the last few years must feel like. Um, but uh, it was a fantastic experience and I can't wait to do it again. Lowest round of golf. I have shot five under par gross uh, a couple of times, uh, probably you know, I, I shot it once around the Grove golf course, which was probably maybe my best round. Uh, I also shot three under par around Hollingwell. That was also another very good round, uh, but that's uh, long in the past. The way the world is going, you know, electric cars, all the manufacturers are producing electric cars. Um, I'm not a huge fan, but how can I be a huge fan? You know, my business model is buying and selling the world's greatest cars, and you know, lots of classic cars, vintage cars. You know, these are cars that engineering. Uh, you know, what's what's the quote that Enzo Ferrari once said that? Uh, aerodynamics are for um, guys who don't know how to build engines or something along those lines. You know, for me, I think it's pretty sad. I've got kids and I can only imagine my boys getting to 18 or 21 and, you know, sharing the car world and experience with them and that smell of petrol, and that big V12 engine, you know, to me is part of motoring and uh, 
it's a little bit sad that the cars are all going electric but that's the way the world is and hopefully people will appreciate um, and not forget you know the cars that we we basically concentrate on. One last meal. Um, oh, I love food. What would it be? I would probably have smoked salmon to start. I would probably have beef wellington for main course and I would have vanilla ice cream and fresh strawberries for dessert. simple knowledge I, I emphasize to my staff I emphasize to my kids knowledge is power in whatever you do whatever you're discussing um, you need to try and be an expert in your field and when you are restoring a Ferrari uh, a Maserati then the body shops we use in the, you know, in the Modena region, these people and their, it's been passed down to them from generation to generation, and they have a far superior knowledge on the cars than what restorers do in America, than what restorers do in the UK. And look, you know, we have friends, restorers in America, and the same in the UK businesses that we support however if you're looking to get a Ferrari restored then I myself believe that the people we use in Italy such as Brandoli and Cremonini um, are far superior to any restoration from anyone in the UK and they're more exact than the restorations that you see in America you know I, I will um, Pebble Beach, I love going there, I love looking at the cars, and some of the cars are so beautifully restored, but on some occasions they're incorrectly restored, they're too shiny. Um, and I think the quality of the work in Italy is uh, just exact. I barely speak English, barely. So no, I don't speak any other languages. I'm not a huge TVR fan, um, I never have been, I say it as it is, uh, I don't want to cause any offence, uh, but I'm not a TVR fan, the new car I don't particularly think is very beautiful, nor do I think it has, uh, or will have a very good resale value. This is a difficult one because, you know, when I look at the cars that we have in stock at the moment, we have so many fantastic cars. We have so many cars with such amazing provenance. Um, and they're all special for different reasons. You know, we have cars with race history. We have cars with special ownership history. You know, we've got Prince Michael of Kent, um, Aston Martin V8, Vantage, Volante, POW, um, literally on the showroom floor. Uh, they only built 22 POWs. Um, all of them are special, and then this is Prince Michael of Kent. Um, so that's uh, that's a great car. I, d I can't think of one particular car that uh, stands out uh, because we have so many great cars with great histories. The one that got away, uh, I don't remember a particular car that was um, that special that I can um, recall getting away. Obviously there's been occasions where we've missed deals, we don't close every deal. Uh, there's been cars that I probably in hindsight look back on and think that I should have paid a little bit extra and just bought it. But 
uh, on the day it was the right decision and I didn't want to pay any more and maybe it got sold elsewhere but there isn't one particular car that is so special that got away because you know, normally we're pretty good at closing deals and if there's a car that is outstanding we're always happy to pay a top price and we're not shy in putting the effort in to get the deal done. So if it means jumping on a plane, flying the other side of the world, happy to do it and happy to do it with no notice. Do I speak to my father? Yes. Duesenbergs, um, you know, I love uh, I love the, uh, the Model SSJ that Gooding sold uh, in 2018. You know, beautiful car. I think for Europeans, uh, American classics, we don't totally understand because aesthetically they're um, much bigger cars than what we're used to. Uh, but, you know, you can appreciate the coachwork uh, from some of the early cars. And um, you know some of the Duesenbergs are absolutely fantastic. The best V12 modern Ferrari 550 onwards. I would have to go with a Ferrari 599 SA Perta because it's basically a Ferrari 599 GTO with the roof, without a roof. I like convertible cars. A 599 GTO is a fantastic car. 599 Aperta, one of only 80, although it's believed that about 114 and 100, or 115 were actually built. A little naughtier Ferrari, but anyway. Um, I would probably say a 599 SA Aperta because 599 GTO is a great car and it's convertible, which I love. And it's super rare. And we've sold nine or 10 of the so-called 80, so. I don't particularly like a Porsche 996. I think it's the weakest of the 911s. I think a 993 for me. I love 993s. I really like 997s. I really like 991s. 996s don't sell particularly well. They're not as valuable as the as some of its um, siblings. In the future, the certain cars, you know, the GT3 RS 996, already commands. Know, quite a high price you know that I don't think they're ever going to be as loved as much as a 997 but will there be a future classic isn't everything going to be a future classic when we get another 25 30 years on in time you know um, we should pinch ourselves really but uh, we have a lot of clients that have collections that would be worth over a hundred million, which is uh, quite astonishing. But uh, you know, we're fortunate that we deal with most people, collectors in the collector car world, the top collectors, and there is there are several collectors that have got collections of north of a hundred million. Cars went up a lot from 2010 until 2015. Um, we saw a huge amount of growth. They were the best performing uh, alternative uh, asset class. You know, uh, outperforming gold, art, um, and because of that, cars. You know, a lot of cars have been realigned their prices have softened have come down you know cars went up that 
probably uh, there was a lot of cars that went up more than they deserved to go up because of their production numbers. You know, the top of the tree cars, the Ferrari 250 GTOs and you know 250 Testarossas and uh, you know particular cars of importance, cars that were unrepeatable, they haven't been affected. If anything, they've got up even more and continued to rise over the last 24 months. But then there's lots of other cars such as Mercedes 300 SLs, you know, a Roadster that made 2,000 cars, a Goldwing that made over 1,000, a Ferrari Daytona isn't a particularly rare car. Um, and a Ferrari Daytona we were selling in 2015, 2016, kind of any example for £750,000. Talking about a right hand drive example that's always commanded a premium over left hand drive. Um, and now we have probably the finest right hand drive example in our showroom at the moment for sale that we're asking 575,000 which shows a huge softening and now I believe it's a fantastic time for people to buy cars you know a lot of these cars where they've come back in price I support and I think it's a good time in the market for people to buy F430 Spider is a good car. I remember buying the first one, uh, first right hand drive car that was ever delivered. I think it was in about April 2005. We've had them in stock on and off ever since. And they're a good car, you know, good car, uh, good gearbox, nice car to drive. I slightly prefer manual, I would say, over an F1. The residuals are. are are good and uh, yeah, break up. Best gear change in a car? Oh, uh, off the top of my head, 250 GTO. You know, I recall the first GTO I ever drove, which was um, uh, Lord Laidlaw's car, the car that we sold uh, this year. And I remember driving it for the first time a few years ago. And the one thing that uh, stuck in my mind wasn't just the fact of how well connected everything was on the car, but uh, the gear change was just um, a pleasure, just a uh, fantastic experience. You've got that open gate and uh, clunking it from second to third or third to second. You know, that's something that uh, sticks, sticks in my mind. Right, okay, um, not the Aston Martin. I don't like any modern Aston Martins. I, you know, I think the Valkyrie that they're building will be a fantastic car. Otherwise, I'm not a fan of any of their other models. So I wouldn't be choosing the DB11. I wouldn't choose the Maserati Gran Turismo. I think it's a little bit old hat, you know, it's due a humongous facelift, not even a facelift, actually, it needs a new model. Um, I would probably say, I'd probably go towards the McLaren 720S. That's a good looking car and it's a fantastic car to drive. New, they're not selling very well. There's a huge depreciation, but uh, I think a 12 month old car around £150,000 is a good buy. And I think that's a, a great car. The first car I ever sold was a Porsche 911 and I was 11 years old. Um, I was in my father's showroom and uh, an existing client walked in. My father wasn't he wasn't, uh, he wasn't in and uh, the salesperson that he had at that point, um, I think it was either on the phone or tied up a long time ago now. And uh, yeah, somehow that's where it all started and that's when, uh, that's, when, that's when it all took off. A 
I love all of my own cars, but I have a real soft spot for my Lamborghini Miura, uh, the orange car. My wife also likes it. We've uh, we've used it quite a bit. I've done about four thousand miles in it, and that's a car that I don't ever see myself. I voted for Boris. I voted for Conservative. I think Jeremy Corbyn is a communist. I think he will or would have ruined the country, um, bankrupted the country. I think he his campaign was awful and uh, there's no way if Jeremy Corbyn got in then we wouldn't stay we wouldn't have stayed in the UK we would have uh, we would have left ah the GTO tour how did it come about uh, I recall chatting with uh, Ian my friend uh, Ian Poulter we were talking about doing a car rally together which we've spoken about for a few years we were then talking about doing one with our wives. We then said, let's invite some other like-minded individuals. He has a 288 GTO. I have a 288 GTO. It was the 35th anniversary of the model. There had never been a rally dedicated to a 288 GTO before. We thought it would be quite cool to put the very first one on. And one thing led to another, um, and that's that's what we, we decided to do it together. We had a great time, by the way. It was, you know, I've done the Mille Miglia, the Colorado Grand, you know, lots of very good car events, rallies. And I tell you, I really, really enjoyed that event this year. We were in some beautiful locations, staying at the most fantastic hotels. We had 10 fantastic couples that I would choose to go on holiday with any time in the future. Um, and we had a really good laugh for four days. Our next event is gonna be in 2021. We're gonna announce the model, but it's not gonna be a GTO. It will be another Ferrari though. So watch out for it. Why aren't Chiron's more desirable? Uh, Chiron is a great car, drives fantastic, build quality is fantastic. I don't think a Veyron is aesthetically the most beautiful car in the world, nor do I think Chiron is. I think the the sales, the maintenance costs of a Bugatti, of a Veyron, of a Chiron holds them back because we have lots of clients who, you know, don't use their cars that much. They have collections, they have multiple cars, they have somewhere between 3 to 10 to 20 to 50 to 100 cars and, you know, a car will just sit in the collection, may, might do 100 miles a year, might do 100 miles in 5 years. and the general feedback that I receive from my clients is they don't like the idea of having to spend £25,000 on tyres for their Veyron or £15,000 a year servicing it, even if the car isn't being driven. And I think that's had a knock-on effect with the Chiron. Um, I also don't think, and I'm not here to criticise anybody, I'm not you know, qualified enough to criticize anybody but I am a second-hand car salesman and I know my market quite well and I don't think Bugatti go around the sale process of their cars the same way that I would um, there doesn't seem to be any need any need of urgency for a buyer to to go and buy the new model you know with Ferrari as soon as a new Ferrari or a new Porsche is launched people are queuing up like I better order one of those before they're gone where Bugatti they spread their production over so many years um, I think they could support 
their second-hand sales better than they do. Um, I love Bugatti, I have a great relationship with them. Um, I think we support the second-hand sales of Veyrons better than all of their dealers worldwide combined. There was a period of time about 12 or 18 months ago that I physically had five Veyrons that we owned in stock. And you know, you go to somebody like HRO and Bugatti, um, they don't buy, they've got the Bugatti franchise and they don't buy, um, they don't buy Bugattis for stock, they don't buy Veyrons. Um, and then because of the after sales, the, the maintenance costs of a Veyron, it concerns people, it annoys people. And with Chiron's, um, you know, people do take that on board because they do think if I keep this car and I'm going to keep it in five years' time, how much is it going to cost me for the ownership of the car in three, four, five years that people don't, didn't have with the likes of a Ferrari Enzo or a Porsche Carrera GT? Um, you know, people are starting to get a little bit more concerned on the hybrid supercars now, wondering now that they're out of warranty. How much will it cost to replace batteries on their LaFerrari or the McLaren P1 or the Porsche 918? And that's why those cars have also softened in price. Um, I do think they'll come back. That Holy Trinity, they're all pretty cool cars. They were the first of the hybrid generation of supercars and they'll always be the first. So, but Bugatti, you know, I would like to see the manufacturer support their second hand cars more than they do and I would also like to see them reduce the cost of the maintenance of their second hand cars. Pinion on Pagani. I love Pagani. Love Pagani. The first Pagani I ever bought was a C12 S, I'm not even sure if it was a normal C12, actually it's gone back a long time ago, and I sold it for 200 and, I think I paid 210,000 and sold it for 240,000 and thought I'd done particularly well and that same car today is probably, you know, three million pounds. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a want to look back on. Um, Pagani though, the Zonda is, a fantastic car, one of my favourite modern supercars and uh, I think that's a car that is probably a 10 million dollar car one day and maybe not too far in the distant future, maybe within five years. Um, it's probably only second to a McLaren F1 in desirability in a modern day supercar. Advice to somebody starting up in the motor trade, um, make sure it's what you really want to do. You know, the, the motor trade is a very hard business, a very cutthroat business. Uh, you need to work extremely hard. You need to set, stay extremely honest because your reputation is everything. You can't buy a reputation and it only takes one bad experience, one bad move to ruin your reputation. Don't get yourself in too much financial debt. You know, try not to take any debt on board if possible. Um, and concentrate on a sector that you're particularly knowledgeable about. And if you're not particularly knowledgeable about it, then become particularly knowledgeable about it because you'll get caught out. You know, there's so many people that come into my business, brokers, and they read about selling 10 million pound cars and, you know, send me an email or call up and say, hey, I know of this car for sale and they don't, they're just opportunists. And, you know, they're not, they don't last. They, they're here today and they're gone tomorrow. You know, if you want to, if you want to make a profession in this business, then 
you have to be good at what you do, you have to be knowledgeable at what you do, you have to be honest, you have to be trustworthy, because reputation is everything. And if you're gonna if you're gonna be here for the long run, that's what you need. Thanks guys. Uh, that rounds up this episode of Tom Talks. We try to answer all of your questions. Obviously, you'll appreciate that there were some questions that were duplicates. Um, we didn't avoid any questions, and you know, my I'm very transparent, and my answers are my answers. So, hopefully, you enjoyed it. And uh, next time, we'll be back to the cars.